Annenberg Media. Sometimes, as we go through life, we master our experiences. Sometimes we don't. It's part of being human to experience a wide range of moods. It's normal, for instance, to be happy or sad, elated or moderately depressed. But sometimes our moods may be inappropriate or they may interfere with our ability to function. The depression was the worst part. It would just continue and continue and I know at one time, about three years ago, I sat in this living room. For three months, I couldn't get off of the couch. I couldn't go outside. I didn't want my neighbors to see me. I didn't want anyone to see me. I didn't want to, um, to dress up. I, I was afraid to go everywhere. And then I went through all that, and it was like, that's it. And it was like a eureka. And I felt like I was overcome by this energy force. And I thought, and it was like, God, somebody had taken over and was driving. I just accelerated, and uh, and it was it was like I wasn't even holding on to the wheel. It was there was an energy, like an electricity, and uh, I accelerated, and I was probably doing about 120 miles an hour, and there were car. It was a two-lane highway, and I started to run cars off the road, going head on, not backing off. I was waiting for them to veer out of the way. I mean, I was running them off the road. In this program, we will show what it feels like to have mood disorders, and how they disrupt people's lives. The people we will meet represent the general population of such disorders. We will also explore factors that contribute to the disorders and examine treatments that seem to work. Dr. Danielle Knafo is a psychoanalytic psychotherapist in New York City, where she teaches a course in abnormal psychology at the New School for Social Research. She gives an example of when moods are in the normal range. I thought I would begin with a commonplace example that most people can relate to and empathize with, um, and that is the, the moods that come as a result of feeling that one is falling in love. Susan met John on a blind date, and she liked him very much, and the date went very well, and uh, John reciprocated Susan's own feelings of interest in him and he was very romantic and asked her out on a date for the following evening. So they left and Susan was in a very, very good mood and in high spirits, went home, couldn't fall asleep. She was so excited, but it didn't bother her because she was just thinking about her budding romance. The next day when she went to work, Susan wasn't bothered by her boss's arrogant attitude, which usually annoys her quite a bit. She skipped lunch because she she didn't have an appetite, and um, she just anxiously awaited for this date of theirs, the next date. Now what happened, John called her at work, and he canceled the date. He gave some vague excuse about uh, his family. It wasn't clear. They rescheduled, though, for three days later, and Susan, her elated mood dropped suddenly. She became angry, anxious, nervous and even a little, a little bit depressed. Susan's moods were entirely within the normal range. Even though they vacillated quite a bit, her, her moods were normal, and we could empathize with them. These are things that everybody feels. We all know what it is to have moods. We all have felt mellow, anxious, dejected, um, angry, uh, whatever. These are all moods that we know from our da daily experiences. So moods are universal experiences. When moods are not normal, 
they become, they, they have the tendency, the person who, who expresses pathological moods or moodiness has the tendency to be moody, to shift a lot in terms of their moods, and also to become fixated on one or the other end of the scale. It is estimated that 15 million Americans will experience what's called major depression at some point in their lives. This includes symptoms such as weight loss, insomnia, a negative self-image, and even suicidal thoughts. It's not the mood itself that denotes pathology, but its extent, severity, and duration. When left untreated, depression can often go away by itself, but for many people, it persists. Depression may begin as a reaction to specific life experiences, such as the death of a loved one, job loss, divorce, or reacting to growing old. Margarita is 28 and lives in the Bronx, New York. She had her first depressive episode last year when her husband was arrested. She is being treated with antidepressant medication and psychotherapy, and she is improving. Right now I'm living with my parents. Uh, this is their home. Well, if I, I'm living here for financial reasons. Along with her parents, Margarita shares this apartment with her two children, her grandmother and sometimes her brother. Oh, Let me get that. Let me get that. Here. Oh, you hog. That's mine. No, it doesn't matter here. Since her husband's arrest, Margarita has had plenty of time to think of their life together. We had problems. It's, um, I don't really know how to describe it. He just, uh, he worked off and on. I think he hung out with his buddies more than he spent more time at home. Uh, he got into things that, um, I don't really think I want to go into it, but, um, things that really upset me. And, um, he was out here for about a year before he got arrested. And he did two years in prison the first time. He came back out, and um, he was okay for a while. And again, he got into his stuff, and things just started going downhill again. And currently, he is in Sing Sing prison, doing five years uh, for attempted murder. And that has really put its toll on me. That has really, really, really hit home. Margarita, when she came in, she presented with an acute depressive episode, uh, mm, which uh, expressed itself in symptoms of uh, Esther Bayet, a psychiatrist who has helped Margarita. Um, insomnia. Uh, mm, weight loss, uh, uh, she had uh, difficulty in eating, in concentrating. She was attending school at the time and she had to stop briefly because she couldn't concentrate there. I always wish night would come because um, I would fall asleep and I didn't have to think about anything. During the day, if I had to be in the house, it would depress me even more. And um, why? Because after I did whatever I had to do around the house, all I had to do was either look at TV or sit down, or read or whatever. Um, I couldn't concentrate on the TV. I couldn't concentrate on reading. And all I had to do was sit down and think, and that I didn't want to do. And um, that really bugged me. I think somebody put me in a hole, stuck dirt, and I couldn't, I mean, I felt like I couldn't get out. I thought, actually, that I was never going to get out of this. Um, they kept telling me, well, the medication, this, that, and I kept saying, you're right, you're right, this is not going to work. I mean, I myself was also being negative, so, and um, I felt really, wow. I can't even describe it. It, it, it really felt bad. 
Phyllis is also being treated for major depression with medication and psychotherapy. But in all other respects, her life is radically different from Margarita's. She is 64 years old and lives in Peoria, Illinois. She began to experience devastating depressions in her 20s, but neither family members nor doctors recognized the symptoms. She was finally diagnosed two years ago. I would say that I am a middle-of-the-road person. I'm kind of traditional. I love to sew, I love to read, and I like to crochet. I used to wear the average shoe size and the average dress. I, I don't think of myself in anything, any other way. Well, we've lived in this house 39 years. I thought we paid that. We did. Oh, that's good. Oh, that's our homestead thing. There's a water bill from Curia. Oh, my, my husband is my friend. We'll be married 45 years in January. He's a wonderful man. I have given him a lot of problems in the years that we've been married. You won another $10 million. Oh, boy. Think so? <laughs> you do that about every other day. <laughs> oh, yeah. During the 40 years Phyllis went undiagnosed, she went to many medical doctors and had countless tests looking for an answer to why she didn't feel right. And when I'd go in, he'd say, but you look so good, you know. I said, but I couldn't explain to him. And I was felt guilty because I was taking his time up and there was nothing wrong with me because I, I was told that over and over every day, you know, forget yourself, there's nothing wrong with you. And so finally, when, when it got worse and worse, I still insisted that there must be something that could help me. They put me Many people thyroid. with major that depression initially think right. they have only physical problems, so they seek help from a physician. And in fact, they may never get to a mental health practitioner at all. So it is not surprising that people like Phyllis can be confused about what's wrong with them. Depression can come in many forms, from the mildest that may go undetected, to the most acute, requiring hospitalization. Dr. Jan Fawcett is a professor and chairman of the Department of Psychiatry at Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's Medical Center in Chicago. The milder forms of depression may be exemplified by a high executive who flies a corporate jet and who feels a lot of physical symptoms occurring over a period of time with a gradual onset, feels a sense of malaise, decreased energy, decreased enjoyment of life, but still goes on able to work and function as far as others are concerned, but as far as he's concerned, is only working at 30 or 40 percent of his usual capacity. This person may be very unhappy, their life may be very difficult for them, but others may not even notice. And many people are working and functioning in this state. This same person may respond to treatment and feel a thousand times better once they're adequately treated. But to the outside world, people who don't know them, they may look exactly the same. That's the mildest form of the illness. In acute or severe depression, the psychomotor retardation is even, in, is, is even more intensified. Uh, the person moves more slowly, speaks more slowly. Here, the person actively withdraws from social contacts. He doesn't want to be involved with, pe with other people, just wants to be left alone. During this, uh, in severe depression also, the person can no longer function as well as they could. Um, they find they have no motivation to work to be involved in anything. Nothing seems uh, worthwhile. The depression was the worst part. It would just continue and continue. And I know at one time about three years ago, I sat in this living room. For three months, I couldn't get off of the couch. I couldn't go outside. I didn't want my neighbors to see me. I didn't want anyone to see me. I didn't want to, um, to dress up. I, I was afraid to go everywhere. And um, I think it was because I just felt like I was going to be this other person all the time and that the real person, myself, was, would be trapped and, I, and I'd never be known again. As bad as Phyllis's depression was, there are more severe forms. In psychotic depression, there is a break with reality. Here, the person experiences delusions 
um, usually associated with guilt or self-blame. So you can see some of the things, they just become extreme forms of what we saw in, in the milder forms of depression. They may have hypochondriacal delusions about their bodies, that something is wrong with their bodies, that their brain is melting, that their heart has stopped, that they, have, they suffer from some kind of terminal disease, like cancer or AIDS. Now, in the most pronounced form of depression, called depressive stupor, all of the previous symptoms are aggravated to the nth degree. Here, the person really uh, does not respond to the outside world at all, just lies mutely in bed, and even has to be spoon-fed to be kept alive. In general, though, the, the subjective sense of the depressed person is that they're living life beneath a cloud. And you feel lonely, tired, sometimes you even wish you were not here. One person who experienced a very severe depression um, told me, he described it as though Hurricane Hugo had gone on in, inside of his head and now he was left with the destruction of the hurricane. Another patient described her years of severe depression as living in a black hole and really the whole time uh, believing that she would never again see the light in that hole. And so that's, that's really how depressives feel. Given the intensity of major depression and the sense of worthlessness and hopelessness that often accompany it, it's not surprising that suicidal impulses may occur. I went out and I sat in my swing on the porch. That was another place that was my safe place. And it was three o'clock in the morning. I knew that everyone was in the house because the air was on. I knew that if I sat there, I knew what I'd do next. All I had to do was to open the screen door into the garage, go in there, and because the air conditioning was on, no one would hear, I would start the car, and I would roll the windows up, and I would go to sleep, and I would never have to have that pain again because I wasn't worthy to live. I wasn't a good wife, a good mother. I wasn't a good sister, a good niece. I wasn't a good daughter. I wasn't good anything. I was terrible. And I didn't want anyone else to have to stay with me. I thought, I can't live if, I, if everybody goes away from me. I don't want to. I thought, Lord, you just have to understand because I can't do it anymore. I can't come back and come back down here again. I don't want to ever again. <laughs> I got up and I went to the door. My husband opened the back door and he said, something just told me that I should come and get you. I said, let me go, Eddie. I don't want you to be my wife husband. I don't want to ruin your life anymore. Just let me go. <laughs> he put his arms around me. We sat there on that porch till morning. He took me to the doctors and they took me to, the, to a psychiatrist that day. They're tremendous pain and they're also hopeless that anything will take the pain away. It's like being tortured and see no way to get out of the torture, no way to end the pain. And that's when people not only consider suicide, but actually suicide seems like a merciful exit for them, a way to get out of what seems to be just, just a no-exit situation of pain. It is not only depressed people who suffer with this disorder. Their loved ones are affected as well. Jan, Phyllis's youngest daughter, remembers what it was like to grow up with a depressed mother. I'd really reached the point where I was tired of it all. Um, you want to kill yourself, kill yourself. You want to, you know, run out in the middle of the street, do it. I don't want to hear it anymore. You know, you've got problems. You've never dealt with them. And there, I knew that there were problems. I guess I had never really thought that there would be, you know, an actual medical problem where, you know, she could take a pill you know, and straighten it out. I thought that there'd be like counseling and sessions and everything like that. But I, I hated her. 
I hated her. You talk about a love-hate relationship. That's exactly what, what I remember feeling, is that I hated the fact that she could choose, in my mind, to live like this and be this angry and this unhappy all her life when she had a choice to get help. While 15 million Americans will experience a major depression during their lives, only one and a half million, like Rodney, a 28-year-old art director, will suffer from bipolar disorder or manic depression, a different but related disorder characterized by mood swings. Rodney experiences both depressive and manic episodes. He has lived in Peoria for four years, but was raised in a small farming community nearby. Last year, Rodney had his first manic episode and was put on a medication called lithium carbonate. Up until that time, he had experienced severe depressive episodes. So I was depressed at this point, and it was just, and I was just slipping, and 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 it was at a kind of an accelerated rate. My parents could see that could see that I was depressed, could see that there was a problem. I would sit and like get up in the morning for breakfast and I would just sit and stare out a window and look at a tree, you know, and they would be talking to me and I would just I would just be void of conversation. So the patient with a unipolar depression can look just like a bipolar patient when they're both in a depression. Their depressions may look exactly the same. But the bipolar patient at different times may have other symptomatology either at other times in the past over life space or a year or so, or in some cases, more severe cases, the patient may cycle from one mood to the other within the hour or from day to day. So the bipolar patient has a much more complicated illness with changes in mood as opposed to the unipolar patient that may have just recurrent depressive episodes. As a result of his treatment, Rodney is doing well. But it took a while to put his life back together after particularly severe manic episodes. There is a wide range of mania, from what Rodney experienced to milder forms, which can go undetected. Mania may range from hypomania, which is a mild form of mania, all the way to severe manic psychosis. Now, a person who's hypomanic may look like the American dream. They may look like the person who has it all, who has energy, attractiveness, they have increased sexual uh, energy, they're optimistic, they can do everything, they're very confident people. They may want to party, they have a tremendous sense of humor, they're generative, they, they have imagination, and everybody looks at them and say, gee, I wish I could be like that and up and so optimistic and positive in this world of apathy and problems that we all fu function in. A person who's hypomanic may look very healthy. And in fact, many people who are very successful do have hypomanias. Not all successful people, but many. And, and uh, that is almost looked at as health until a person's hypomania gets to the point where it interferes with their judgment and they start overestimating what they can do or what others should be able to do. And they make bad decisions and they, uh, or until they cycle down into a depression and then can't function. That goes all the way into a severe man mania where an individual is psychotic and delusional, may believe they're the second coming of Christ, may believe that they control the world, may uh, actually become paranoid, fearful that others are trying to kill them, may carry weapons, may actually commit homicide or, or, or put people at enormous risk or put themselves at enormous risk because of their behavior, which is a function of their psychosis and their judgment, which has been totally distorted by the process. I went on about a seven mile trip, eight mile trip through a small community. There were people walking across the streets in this, in this small town on a, Friday, on a Saturday, night, Saturday night around six o'clock. And I came blasting through there at 120 miles an hour. You know, I, with my horn on, with my headlights on, with my hazard lights flashing, with my stereo cranked up with my sky roof open with my windows rolled down and I was just screaming through town and and someone else was driving I mean someone else was in control of the car I was no longer I was just a body and I hit two cars I sideswiped two cars uh, uh, I hit one and kept on going it didn't even phase me it was like 
it bounced me off the side of the road. I mean, it, it, I, I hit it in one car so hard it knocked me off. I mean, it knocked me clear across another lane. Uh, I, I kept on. I kept on. It didn't stop. I didn't. I didn't stop. And I, I busted a front axle on my car. It caved in the whole left side of my front of my car. Shattered the windshield. My head went through the windshield. Uh, I broke the seat. Uh, the car came to a, a rest on, on a on a bridge, and um, the music was still on. The, the the power was still on. The lights were still on. The hazard lights were still flashing. I crawled from the wreck. And it was like the phoenix from the flame. I started ripping off all my clothes. I, I stripped down. As I was crawl, as as I crawled out of the car, I thought I was Jesus Christ. I thought that I thought this is it. This is the dawn of a new age. That I am the second coming. Well, Rodney showed a rather extreme form of the illness. He described on the tape that I saw driving his car at 120 miles an hour on windy roads, uh, driving through a small town at that speed. Uh, which obviously could kill other people or uh, seriously uh, kill or hurt himself. Uh, there's, there's just no limit to what this illness could have done in his state. Uh, as he describes it, he, he uh, eventually his car crashed. He climbed out of the wreckage, stripped off his clothes, thought he was the second coming of Christ, and began jumping up and down and preaching in the road in the face of traffic you know, terrifying people uh, because of his uh, behavior. He was delusional. He was in a very extreme form of the illness. Uh, he, I'm sure he looked like a, a raving maniac to people who, who saw him. And yet, he was in, a, in an extreme form of mania. And when he was describing it, he was back to his normal state, which, which shows the, the contrast between how sick a person can be with mania and how well they can be when their illness is under control and treated adequately. Just as there are various types of mood disorders, there are various causal factors. We'll discuss bipolar disorder in a little while. First, we discuss major depression. There are various theories about the factors that contribute to depression. Sigmund Freud, for instance, postulated that depression occurs when someone is in conflict about angry or hostile feelings. Unable to accept and to express the anger, the person turns it inward. So to Dr. Knafo talks about Freud's theory as it applies to major depression. Freud asserted that any relationship of consequence of necessity is an ambivalent one, involving both hate, hate feelings and love feelings. And the depressive person can be thought of as someone who has difficulty with the hostile side of their ambivalent feelings towards the loved one. The relationship is, a very, is very important to the depressed person, but they have difficulty com expressing both sides of, of, this, um, of their feelings. They feel that if they express their hostile, the hostile side of their feelings, that they may lose the loved one, the love relationship, and they don't want to do that. So they, they find a solution to expressing this hostility. And what the solution is, according to Freud, is that they take that anger that they feel towards the loved one and they turn it inwards, towards themselves, towards their own self-image. We have a patient who is, had enormous anger built up toward her husband, not only as a result of his being arrested and incarcerated at this point, but as a result of a long history of marital conflict. Um, and and that anger had never really been resolved. It was highly conflicted because she felt a certain dependency on this person and obviously was concerned about expressing this anger would interfere with their relationship and remove this person who she had become quite dependent on. It's that kind of psychological conflict or conflict between opposing feelings that usually results in the development of these kinds of depression. And sometimes I would just look at him and just throw my hands up in the air and tell him I give up, do what you want to do. And But um, meanwhile, I was eating all this and feeding it and not really doing anything for myself. At the time, it was a love that really, really hurt. I really don't know how to explain. I think I was afraid of losing him. 
um, of him leaving me or whatever. Not yeah. all depression is a matter of anger turned inward. There are alternative ways of explaining depression. Right. Well, I think our current thinking is that the causes of depression are mixed. There is no one cause of depression, even for a single person. It's unlikely that there is one thing that causes their depression. And so we think of it as a risk factor model, where depression develops in the context of risks. And when those risks get high enough, the person goes over some threshold to develop this self-sustaining depression. And those risks might be divided into three categories, psychological, environmental, and biological. On the biological risk side, we have genetics, other physiological uh, conditions, which give us a predisposition toward becoming depressed. On the psychological side, we have thinking patterns, cognitive style, personality, and various factors like that that may leave us at greater risk for depression. And on the environmental side, we have things like stresses and lack of social supports, which leave us at greater risk for depression. And when the sum total of all of these risk factors get high enough, then that pushes us over some threshold and we go into a period of clinical depression. For some people, one of those three factors may be stronger than the others, but it's unlikely that there is one cause that someone has a biological depression and nothing else is involved. Uh, it's usually some balance with different weights on the different factors. First of all, the development of a clinical kind of phenomena like depression is a very complex phenomenon, and it involves the development psychologically and physically of the individual. And then on top of that, the need to cope with these sometimes catastrophic social conditions that patients are exposed to. Some of the conditions that Gary Edelstein's clients are exposed to are poverty, unemployment, drugs, homelessness, and increasing amounts of violence. But as both he and Dr. Young point out, all the risk factors have to be attended to. So what we're looking at is not only the acute exposure to a particular social problem, but the tendency of that individual to have been exposed to those problems all through their lives. All of this sets up the conditions that when a real major social stressor is inflicted upon them, the patient is unable to cope. And that's usually when they present to us with, with clear diagnostic uh, uh, symptomatology. Different populations seem to have different kinds of risk factors. Women, for instance, are twice as likely to suffer from major depression as are men. Dr. Canafo and Dr. Fawcett discuss some of the theories about psychological, biological, and environmental factors that may contribute to this difference. In addition to women living in a long-standing, socially disadvantaged role in our society, we know, and research has shown, that for women, relationships are more significant than for men. Not just more significant, and it doesn't, I'm not saying that for men relationships are not significant, but that women are more affected by relationships, by the fate of their relationships, and they define themselves very much according to the relationships that they're in. Carol Gilligan, a researcher from Harvard, has demonstrated that femininity is largely defined through relatedness, while masculinity is largely defined through separateness. So, if we take this logic further, any losses or traumas in a relationship will be, de will be experienced more, more uh, seriously by a woman than by a man, more depressing. The woman will tend to be more depressed by uh, a loss in a relationship or a major change in a relationship than a man will be because this is because she defines herself um, and her success in life through her relationships. I was a failure, I felt, because I couldn't have my own children. That was the first heartbreak that I had. Then when we got our children, we adopted our children, I felt like I was a failure as a mother because I didn't know how to raise them. I didn't know if I was raising them properly. I was trying to copy what everyone else had done in their life, and it wasn't coming true for me. I loved their father so much, I was willing to do anything for him. Um, it hurt. And um, it's like I, I see him now once in a while, and it's like I tell him now, I love you, but it's not the same. 
now I know when to say no to you. Now I know that I can do it for myself. I don't have to depend on you. More women come in for treatment than men. It may be, it may be as high as three to one in a clinic, women to men. W women accept treatment more easily or seek treatment more easily than men. Men wait, wait till they're much worse off before they'll get treatment, usually till they can't work or else, and they have a much higher rate of suicide. Why do more women have depression than men? And I think they do. It may be because less women are alcoholic than men. Men are much more likely to have alcoholism, and alcoholism and depression overlap a great deal. So many men may become alcoholic as a way of treating their depression. It's a very poor treatment for depression. It makes it worse, but, but it allows the person to get by for a longer period of time. And uh, that's, that may be one possibility, is the overlap between alcoholism and depression, or alcohol abuse and depression. The other reasons may have to do with hormonal differences between men and women. There are considerable differences, and uh, you know women frequently develop premenstrual depression. Women with depression frequently get much worse premenstrually. Uh, this is not uncommon. So there may be a hormonal difference. And there may be a lot of social differences in terms of social roles that have to do with women in our society that, that exert different pressures on them than on men that account for this. Along with psychological and environmental factors, experts believe that biology plays a role in both major depression and bipolar disorder. There seems to be a strong genetic component, especially for bipolar disorder. Rodney belongs to a support group called Mood Challenge. At a recent meeting, Rodney's mother discussed her first manic episode. At age 55, I had my first one, and the doctor said that that was very unusual mm -hmm. to have it. But I had been under a tremendous lot of stress with Rodney and all he had to go through and other things in our life. And I had just been under a lot of stress. I didn't know anything unusual was happening to me. I felt, you know, I, there had been a few nights that I hadn't slept, but not too many nights. And um, I, um, I just felt like I was really into God. But during all this time, I had tried to pretend that nothing was happening, you know, that I just tried to shut it off. I thought, I have to do this because I had to work, I had to go to work. And families, <laughs> you were really into God, and I thought I was God, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't hear that. The idea of genetics right now is based mainly on the observation of family transmission. That means the occurrence of an illness uh, being more likely if there's a family history of the illness. Now, that doesn't prove genetic transmission. It just suggests it. Uh, somebody looking at the patient's environment could say, well, the environment's also the same in the family, and maybe that transmits the illness. We have reasons to believe from twin studies, where the twin, identical twins have the same genetic material, that the likelihood of the transmission is much greater. And, of course, there's been efforts to identify the genes, which have come up with findings which have not so far held up. So we don't have genetic proof. We don't have ultimate proof, but the evidence is very strong for genetic transmission in both bipolar and unipolar illness, but it's the strongest in bipolar illness. So Rodney probably inherited a predisposition for bipolar disorder from his mother, most likely a dysfunction in the way the brain works. In this highly schematic drawing, nerve cells in the brain carry information in the form of electrical impulses along the length of the cell. For the impulse to cross the synapse, the space between the cells, a chemical called a neurotransmitter must be released into the synapse. The neurotransmitters move across the space and lock into specific receptor sites on the next cell. That's normal brain function. The theories of mood disorders, that includes both depression and mania, uh, are dominated today in today's knowledge base by our knowledge of neurotransmitter function in the brain. So. In major depression, a person may not have enough neurotransmitter at the synapse. In a person who is manic, there may be too much neurotransmitter at the synapse. Summing up, there is no single cause of major depression or bipolar disorder.
there are various contributing factors. One, there may be deep-rooted unconscious conflicts. Two, on the biological level, a deficit of neurotransmitters may result in depression, while an excess may produce manic states. Three, there is strong evidence that some mood disorders, especially bipolar illness, may be genetically transmitted from one generation to another. And four, some depressions may come as a reaction to life events, so environmental factors must be considered. Unemployment, illness, or the death of a loved one may lead to depression. All or some of these factors may be involved, and it is important to assess each person individually to determine what the causes are and what treatments will be most effective. Some people with major depression aren't treated because the episode runs its course, they aren't properly diagnosed, or they just don't seek help. For the rest, there are two general forms of treatment, psychotherapy and medication. Phyllis received both. The appropriate use of antidepressant medications has helped many people with major depression. The treatment for depression would be a medication which would increase the availability of certain neurotransmitters, perhaps norepinephrine, perhaps serotonin. We would use medications like the tricyclic antidepressants, for instance, Elevil or Tofranil are well-known medications. As Dr. Fawcett notes, antidepressants increase the level of certain neurotransmitters. There are two kinds of medications that accomplish this, the tricyclics and the MAO inhibitors. For a long-term mood disorder in which biology is a major causal component, such medications can often work wonders. The problem is they don't work for everyone who takes them. In addition, the dosage must be watched carefully. There can be dangerous physical and psychological side effects. Any medication you, you may take uh, will have side effects. Uh, the importance of the side effects uh, has to be measured uh, against the benefits of the medication and uh, the cooperation and uh, motivation of the patient is extremely important. But my medicine, I, I depended on too much of it at first. I thought, I'll never be sad again. This is wonderful. I'll never have to worry again. But I was wrong. Medication can only do so much. You have to start to make your own recovery on back through the road and you have to go and you have to mend every bridge that you've broken. For some people, medication is enough. And some get better without any treatment at all. Many others need and can benefit from psychotherapy, with or without medication. In therapy, people examine how their life experiences and early events have affected them. For a long time, this has meant psychodynamic psychotherapy, a model in which unconscious conflicts, considered to be at the heart of the depression, are uncovered. At Soundview Clinic, where Dr. Bayet is the medical director, Margarita is being treated by Gary Edelstein, who uses psychodynamic principles. I, I would say that depression was really not only the anger turned inward, but it was the result of the conflict between her anger, her aggression toward the husband, and also her conflicting need, affection, and dependency on the husband. That creates a conflict which is, for the patient, unresolvable and results in them just psychologically giving up. And that's the clinical manifestation of depression. Therapy consequently focuses on the identification of this aggressive impulse and the understanding of how it's being rechanneled and conflicted um, so that when the patient understands that in a more clear way, she's able to accept the feeling and understand that it's an appropriate and, and, and human feeling and doesn't mean that she will deprive herself of that dependency object. Today, in addition to psychodynamic psychotherapy, there are some new short-term psychotherapies available. Right, and, and different individuals need different mixes and even different, even different types of psychotherapy. We talk about psychotherapy as if it's one thing but there are many different types of psychotherapy. Not everybody, in my opinion, should have psychoanalytic psychotherapy that has a depression. Some people need it. Some people would do better with a cognitive form of psychotherapy. I think it takes some expert 
judgment to decide what a person needs. And a per anyone who evaluates people with depression should be familiar with all the different types of therapy available and make a decision on an individual basis what a patient needs in each case. And again, everybody wants simple answers to this question, one or the, either or, one or the other. And that's just not how it works with human beings. They're, they're, they're so, so different and so individual. Well, there's been a lot of advancement in the past 10 or 15 years for psychotherapy and depression. Uh, the two that have emerged as being demonstrated by research to be effective in depression are cognitive or cognitive behavioral therapy and interpersonal psychotherapy. Those are both types of therapy which were at least originally specifically developed for depression and were specifically developed to work in a prescribed period of time, usually two to three months. The theory of cognitive therapy is that our feelings and our behaviors are to a large extent determined by the way we think about things. So for example, if I, someone criticizes something I say, um, and then I might ask you, well, how, do, how am I going to feel when that happens? It's almost impossible to answer that question without knowing what I think about having been criticized. The depressed person has negative evaluations of themselves, tends to put a negative cast on events that happen, a negative view of the world and the future, and therefore feels and behaves in a depressed way. So the way we translate that into therapy is to identify with the person the thoughts that they're having, not an analysis of, their, of the psychodynamics or the psychological processes underneath like you might in traditional therapy, but just what their thoughts are. And then with them, we evaluate whether there are distortions in those thoughts, whether there are alternative ways of thinking about the situation, alternative beliefs that they might have, um, and alternative ways of behaving that might yield different results. And with them, we evaluate those thoughts and beliefs, look for changes that can be made, have the people do what are often called behavioral experiments, where uh, they go out and do something in a different manner than they usually do, and see what happens as a way of changing their evaluation of what's going on, changing their thoughts, and then if their thoughts change, their feelings will naturally change in response. I now know that when I start to think about something sad, that I start to say to myself, I, I try to use the coping skills that my psychiatrist has given me along with the, the help that I've had from Mood Challenge. Like, um, you're really not this bad person. You did this, but you are able to take the responsibility for it now. Which I don't see psychotherapy and medication as an either or a question. Some patients that have more severe depressions are not going to get better, in my opinion, without medication in the more severe level. Uh, many patients uh, need both psychotherapy and medication to fully recover from their depression. There are a few people that can have even severe depressions who have intact personalities who can be treated with medication and some supportive psychotherapy and recover without any further need for therapy. There are those people. But that is not to say that, the, that, that you can replace psychotherapy with medications in patients who need both. You simply can't do it. I would say that really looking at the whole person involves our um, not falling into a particular ideological position, but utilizing all of the knowledge that's available to help our patient. When patients are so severely depressed that they can no longer function, or they are suicidal, and haven't responded to drugs or other therapies, many professionals think that ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, may be the only option left. How ECT works is not fully understood. A convulsion is produced by passing an electric current through the brain. In 80% of those who receive ECT, the depression lifts within weeks. ECT was first used as a treatment for depression in 1938. The controversy that surrounds it is the result of its history of overuse and even abuse. In the 1940s and 50s, ECT was widely used in mental hospitals, often indiscriminately. Patients experienced long-term memory loss, bone fractures, and heart attacks. In the 1960s and 70s, 
ECT fell out of favor, replaced by psychoactive drugs. But psychiatrists were faced with the problem of treating severely depressed patients who didn't respond to medications. ECT has been making a comeback. But there have been changes. The length and the intensity of the electrical charge have been reduced, as have the number of treatments. Patients are now given strong muscle relaxants to prevent broken bones, and they are carefully monitored. In spite of these changes, there remain critics who think that the possibility of long-term memory loss is a high price to pay for the relief of severe depression. The percentage of people with major depression who require ECT is very small. For the majority, psychotherapy and medication prove effective. For bipolar disorder, the same is true. Here, treatment usually involves the administration of the drug lithium carbonate, and some form of psychotherapy. The patient who is, has manic depressive illness, as far as we know, has it for life. Like diabetes or any other metabolic illness that's genetic, they have it for life, which means they could have an episode any time during their lifetime if they're unprotected. There is protection to prevent episodes in the majority, the vast majority of cases, and the most standard protection is lithium carbonate, although there are other new medications we have for patients who don't, aren't protected by lithium carbonate. I think the quality of my life today has never been, it's, it's never been any better. Uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, looking back, like even a year ago, I was unemployed. I didn't know what I was going to be doing, and it's just, con it's, it has just kind of evolved. It's been, I'm spiraling up, and it's just, has worked out great. I'm, I'm managing my, I've, managing my uh, my illness um, you know with lithium I take uh, 1200 milligrams a day the likelihood of recurrence with just average treatment when I say average treatment that includes people who don't take their medicine the risk of five-year risk of recurrence is close to 80 percent in this illness for those who take their medication as prescribed only 20 to 30 percent will have a recurrence over a two-year period but even with medication, psychotherapy may be an important part of their overall treatment. Dr. Canafo relates the history of Lester, a bipolar patient. He had a long history of depression, but he also had had several manic episodes for which he had been hospitalized. So here he was hospitalized this time. He was about the age that his father was when the father had committed suicide. In the hospital, Lester was treated with lithium carbonate and participated in psychodynamic psychotherapy with Dr. Canafo. A lot of work had to be done in terms of separating Lester's identity from that of his father's and also in allowing him to mourn the death of his father. Apparently in his family, emotions were not tolerated, so he was never allowed to grieve his father's death. Fact, Eventually, Lester responded to the treatment, moved out of the hospital, and back into society. In addition to medication and psychotherapy, self-help groups like Mood Challenge in Peoria can offer social support to those who are coping with mood disorders. What you have to remember is that the illness, it, it affects different people differently. Like, it, you, just because you have certain sensations and the illness affects you a, a certain way doesn't mean that it affects other people the we same tend way. We to do that. We you, tend to tunnel right, vision exactly, from our right. viewpoint. Right, you know, exactly. Rod's uh, mania may have been entirely different than mine, right. Right. but the music yeah, and the light, we, we, we got the music and the light. There's a lot of similarities, similar. darling. I'm sorry. There's, there's a lot of similarities, I think, yeah. from just talking with you, I'm not sure. Yeah. My son, uh, unfortunately, isn't, isn't in as good a shape as Rod's in, or you. He's still struggling with trying to get this under control, and right at this moment, he's uh, in a depressed state. He's still, he's functioning going to work, but that's all he's doing. He comes home from work and goes to bed. The other members of the group have been through what I've been through. Uh, they know what I'm feeling. Uh, they know the questions that, that I face uh, about the medication, about treatments, about reestablishing my life in the community. Um, because a majority, of, a majority of them have been there. And, and you just can't get that anyplace else. 
We have talked about two types of mood disorders, major depression and bipolar disorder. For both categories, the episodes can range from mild to severe. When mild, other people wouldn't know that there is anything wrong. When severe, total incapacitation can occur. There are many theories about what causes depression and manic depression. One-dimensional explanations are inadequate. We must evaluate risk factors, psychological, biological, and environmental, and the complex ways they interact, and then assess each person individually to determine which treatment or treatments would be the most beneficial. The bad news is that one in 10 Americans will experience a mood disorder. The good news is that in most cases, mood disorders can be successfully treated. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Night and day. That's, I mean, that's a real easy way of saying that before we lived in darkness and now we live in light. Mm -hmm. It's a real easy way of saying that <laughs> because it's like, okay, it's like this is, once there's a name, once there's a label, it's like, okay, it's not me, it's not her, you know, and you can let it go. You don't have to dwell on, you know, what could have been, what should have been. Um, and it's kind of like, it's kind of like a catharsis in the cocoon. It's like, okay, we're free. Um, she's happy. I mean, I can, I could never disagree with her at all. And, and now I can disagree with her, tell her I disagree with her, and she still likes me. It's like, all right, you know, this is, this is I think I'll keep her, you know, I'll stick around. Oh, I do a number of things. I think, it, I guess, it just when the mood strikes, uh, and it's uh, not the mood disorder, you know. <laughs> you know, it's uh, I like to. Uh, just a couple, just two weeks ago, I uh, went scuba diving down my parents' lake, uh, and really did my first open water dive there, and uh, and that was a, that was a great experience. Uh, you know, and then I like to I like to bicycle ride, and I'm involved in uh, competitive volleyball at the Y. And I mean, that usually carries over for about nine months. It's going to be starting up again shortly, and I'm excited about that. Uh, I just really, I mean, I love life. I mean, I have, I have so, just such a, I think I have such a positive outlook. Um, uh, there's, I can't think of anything I, I don't like to do. I mean, if I, if I haven't done it, I'll try it, you know? <laughs> right.